fact that you call us to gather as one faithful people in your holy house. Lord, as we gather here now in your name, we ask that you might inspire us to seek your truth as we study the history of your church. Lord, we ask that it might not only be a lesson in historical facts, but might also be inspiration and guidance, and perhaps some cases warning to us as we learn how to continue to minister in your name, as we grow all the more in the body of Christ. Lord, now bless these proceedings begun, carried out, and ended in your name, and it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, you are... Free to take notes if you like. I have given you kind of a kind of an outline. Um, kind of an outline. Everybody have an outline? No. Yours? Is, no outlines. Here. Okay. Uh, uh, Pastor Meyer now taking on the servant's mantle here is handing out the remaining outlines. If you don't have an outline, please put your hand up or otherwise make yourself known to Pastor Meyer and he will hopefully provide you with one. And we may have to share, which is, in my mind, a good thing. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Now so, get to it. <laughs> okay, now we're fine. Okay, okay. So, so, so this, this study, which uh, we're, we're going to begin today, really is, is about the early church period. Now, I know somewhere in some newsletter or bulletin it said something about this being about the Reformation period. And if you're here for the Reformation period, allow me to suggest that you are approximately 1,500 years early. Um, but we will get to that. We will get to that. Uh, for, for God, a day is a thousand years, and for Faith the Era, 1,500 years is probably about four months because we will be doing this sometime in the fall, Reformation period, hopefully, if you allow me to come back. Um, so we are working on the early church period right now. Hopefully you're not too disappointed by that. Um, if you have ever attended a walk through the Bible seminar, I know that's something I you did. How many walk through the Bible uh, veterans we have here? A whole lot. Well, uh, it's been a long time since I went through that program, but when I went through that program, the period between the Old and New Testament, which is how many years? Uh, answers on the long. Uh, 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 that period of time, that period of time is sometimes referred to as the, the silent years. And, and I suppose they're called the silent years because it's the period of time after the last recognized Jewish prophet. Right? This is the end of the Old Testament from uh, Malachi, or, 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 or Malachi, as we used to call them back in the book. Um, <laughs> first time, no. no. Uh, Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets to the birth of Christ. And that's sometimes referred to as the silent years because the thought is that God did not speak through his prophets during that time. Um, and, and, and I understand the derivation of the term. But I think those years actually were anything but silent. Because it is during that time, I, I believe, that many of the philosophies, many of the religious understandings that formed the religious scape for Judaism, that formed the religious world into which Jesus is born, were developed during those years. And before we can begin to study the early church and its worship practice and its theologies, I think that we need to understand just a little bit about those, uh, uh, those 400 so-called silent years. And uh, I want to talk about a little bit about, if you take a look at your notes, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on politically during this time. What you're going to see uh, on the first page Look at that first page. Going into the second page, you're going to see six subpoints there. You're going to see six subpoints 
And, and they represent the various rulers, the people who lived in the area, sometimes referred to as Palestine, and the various rulers the Jews had during that time. We'll go through them real quickly. You can see there's, there's Persian rule. And, and by the way, that's Persian rule takes place right after what? Anybody know? Babylonian captivity. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Do you remember where Jesus is having a confrontation? What is he about confronting Jesus? And, and Jesus says some words to the effect of, you know, if you sin, you are a slave to sin. And the people respond, well, actually, no, we, we've, we've never been slaves to anyone. We have, we have Abraham as our father, and we've never been slaves to anyone. Most ironic statements. Because, you see, the, the, the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves in Babylon. Well, they were slightly better than slaves, actually, in, in, in these six groupings. But yet, they were still a, 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 an oppressed and subjected people. We have Persian rule. Now, the Jews were allowed to return to Palestine during that time. Although, at that point, many moved elsewhere. Some stayed in Babylon because business was pretty good, because they adopted the culture, the language, they married, they intermarried, or they traveled elsewhere. Then we get to Greek rule, and that's important. The Greek rule of the Jewish people, because by the time Jesus comes on the scene, there's a big cultural battle going on between Jews who are very much concerned with adhering to their national cultural ways, and Jews would say, you know, those Greeks are pretty smart. They got nice clothes, they got nice architecture, they've got a really nice simple alphabet. You know, we could, we could use some of those Greek ways and still be loyal to, uh, to Yahweh, can't we? So the idea of Hellenization or Greek, Greekification, if you will, coin a phrase, is, is important. Well, we go from Greek rule to Egyptian rule, except that's not that much different than Greek rule, because it was pretty much running the world at that point in time. It's Greek, either politically or culturally, or in some cases, both. We go from Egyptian rule to Syrian rule, also by Greek descent, by the way. And that brings us to... Um, to an interesting, if brief, period, page two, Jewish, Jewish independence under the Maccabees. We'll be talking quite a bit about that because that too was important as we begin to understand the, the political and religious landscape of Jesus' day. And you can see there, it, it, doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't really last but a little more than a century, right? What does it say there, 165 to 63 BC? That's kind of it, Jewish independence. And then we get to Roman rule. When I put down dates, there's 63 BC to 650 CE or 650 AD, with a bunch of question marks after it. Because scholars really don't know when, when did the Roman Empire end. Depends on whom you ask. Depends on how you define the Roman Empire. Um, so, you can see what's, what's happening here. Um, so we're now we're looking at a period called uh, uh, the Second Temple Judaism. By the way, how many temples were there? If you said three, you may have been influenced on a previous course. <laughs> right, but typically, typically and officially, we'll talk about there being what? Two temples. The first temple that was built by Solomon, and the second temple that was built by Herod. Well, not all this Herod had a very, very long lifespan. Because, you see what happened here? Okay, Solomon's temple, right, is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar II in the siege of Jerusalem in 587 BC. A long time ago. That's recorded, by the way, in 2 Kings. Look it up sometime. Okay? Now we get the ascension of Cyrus the Great of Persia, who in many ways was fairly sympathetic to the Jewish people. At least he was more sympathetic than Nebuchadnezzar. 
maybe not raising the bar very high there. And, and that makes possible the rebuilding of the temple. Now, what you're thinking of, Herod's temple, is sometimes referred to as a rebuilding, a rebuilding of that second temple. Now, now I postulate that that's kind of a semantic issue. Have you ever known anyone who did this? Maybe you've done this yourself. You really want to renovate your house, and you want to renovate it to the extent that you basically, you know, you look around. I don't know if you've ever lived in places like this, but I have. You kind of look around and you say, there's nothing wrong with this place, and stick a dynamite can fix. Okay? But you realize that if you were actually to do that, maybe not with a stick of dynamite, but with a backhoe or something, or whatever, some kind of heavy equipment, and you, and you start over again, the town would charge you for what? They tax you based on new construction, which, a whole lot of that. On the other hand, if you keep some portion of the house, typically the foundation and maybe a retaining wall or a beam or a something, you can technically say that you're restoring the house. You can technically say you're rebuilding it. But you know, and your neighbors know, and everybody else knows, and certainly you know when the person you open the door, it's essentially a new house. And I kind of liken what happened with Herod's temple, so we call it Herod's temple to that. Herod goes ahead and he looks at the temple and he says, boy, this is kind of a sad, sad place. This could be so much bigger and better. Herod, by the way, for all the bad rep he gets, was one of the world's great architectural visionaries. Herod loved architecture. Herod sponsored some amazing architectural projects, proving that you don't necessarily have to be a nice person to have artistic vision. So Herod takes this temple and he completely knocks it down. And you can say he left the foundation, except that the footprint of Herod's temple you could fit a couple of the old temple in there. So I stipulate the fact that, and, and, and there's, you know, there are Orthodox Jewish people who want to beat me up, and when this hits the internet, there'll be even more of them to suggest, and by the way, some Christians too, because it gets to a theological issue with some people. Just not. Uh, I think Herod's temple actually is a separate structure. If you don't like that, I will invite you into a debate about it. Perfectly well, polite one. Just not now. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that, that's, that's, that's pretty far afield. Um, Solomon's temple destroyed. Cyrus the Great makes it possible to reestablish the city and rebuild the temple. That's recorded for us, by the way, in Ezra and Chronicles. And, and then something interesting happens. Um, during Syrian rule, during Syrian rule, the, 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 last, uh, the last ruler, Antiochus, he is, um, he gets very angry with the Jewish people. And part of the reason he gets angry with the Jewish people, it, it may not be a bad reason, there's so much fighting, there's so much infighting between the Jewish people, specifically between, as I mentioned, those who really decide, hey, let's be a little more like the Greeks. And those who say, no, everything great is bad. Let's be more like ourselves. And they're really going at it. And, 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 and Antioch is kind of like a parent who sees two children fighting over a, a toy, decides, well, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to desecrate your temple. So he goes ahead and he, uh, he takes a pig. Wait, 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 bad news. He takes a pig and sacrifices them on the altar. And he starts putting up some pagan statues and things. And he says, there, how do you like that? And he starts making some new rules, like, oh, I think I'm going to make it against the law to be circumcised now. And, and, and all of a sudden, the Jewish people, both sides, are saying, what, what, what's up with this? It's kind of funny, it worked. And now this gets these people to, to be reunited. Unfortunately for him, they're reunited against and, the and that brings us to the Maccabean Revolt. Um, they succeed. Not easily. They succeed, um, not for long, 
But there they are. They go ahead and they have some degree of independence. Now, why is that, why is that important to us? Uh, go ahead and turn the page, third page. By the way, I apologize for the number of these pages. Turn the page, you should see a page at the top of it that says, Setting the Religious Scene. Um, after the Maccabean forces defeat the Syrians, well, now all of a sudden they have independence. And, and, and they need something. What, what does any independent nation need to do? Well, yeah, of course, they've, they've done that already. They've kind of done that. Maybe even before you can defend yourself, though, or after you defend yourself, what is it you probably learned in school? Mostly spurious, but probably learned this in school. Um, so, Continental Army defeats England, uh, or Great Britain, I should say, and, and George Washington, the heroic, victorious general, and everybody says, okay, George, how would you like to be our president? You know, and supposedly, before they said that, George, you'd be our king now. And George says, what, what are you, nuts? Uh, we've, been, we've been fighting for years to get rid of that kind of thing. Now, I, I have my doubts on the accuracy of that story, but supposedly he was offered kingship. And he said, no way. We had a president. I suspect the whole thing's a lot more complicated than that. But let's just go with it for now. After you've defended yourself, the next thing you need is to figure out how to govern yourself. And you've got to figure out how to govern yourself, by the way, before the next time you defend yourself. Before you can worry about standing armies and all this kind of stuff, you need a ruler. So here, here's what happens. The, the, the ruling general, the reigning general, the victorious general, um, decides with some of his other army officials, who are we going to make to be in charge? How, what kind of government are we going to have? And they decide, well, let's go back to the way it used to be or the way we wish it were, let's go ahead and set up a priestly government. Let's go ahead and set up a government where the religious authorities and the secular authorities are one and the same. Let us set up a theocracy. Do you remember how it was in first couple times? You did not have a priest ruling the nation. You had first what? Judges, and then kings. Okay. However, there was another side to that authority. For example, when David, the king, as it is good to be the king, that king David, he gets himself into trouble because he likes to walk around on roofs and look at naked women. And, and you know, because he is the king, he can do something about that. Well, he's the king, and there's no higher authority than him, right? So he can do whatever he wants. No. There's someone who puts David in his place, is there not? Who's that? Nathan. Nathan. And Nathan is a? Well, Nathan's a prophet, actually. Yeah, Nathan's a prophet. And, and, and that's kind of how the government had worked. You had a, 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 a civil authority, the kings, and you also had a religious authority. And, and by the way, the way you've got to be a king was that a prophet anointed you. That's how David got to be king. Remember how David got to be king? Okay. You know, they bring in all the big, strong, handsome brothers, and, and the prophet says, is, is there anybody else? Yeah, just David. He's, he's a little kid. He's out in the chief. Yeah, that's the guy I want to see. Bring him in. And he's anointed king. Well, now you have the Maccabeans saying, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to set up a priest. The priest is going to be in charge of us religiously. The priest is going to be in charge of us as a secular people as well. So they go ahead and they take uh, Judas Maccabeus' nephew. His nephew, John. Think a little nepotism is involved there? So, so they think, yeah, John's a good kid. He's got his head square on his shoulders. He's pretty smart. He's faithful. He was a good fighter. Um, so he becomes the first priestly monarch in the Hasmonean dynasty. Now, that's 
okay, sort of, because these Maccabeans, they're like George Washington, or Paul Revere, and they're war heroes. They're important people. They, they freed the people from outside rule. Except that once they're on top, they're not doing things according to protocol. You know, just, just like in, in, in this country, you know, there are those who would say that aspects of the government are not happening according to the proper protocols, and that makes people upset. I'm not saying there's anybody that here who thinks that. Right? Just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, make sure you're awake. And um, that's kind of how they felt. They said, yeah, okay, great, great, Matthew Brothers, it's, it's great that you guys free us now. But, but now you're breaking all rules. And, and that's, just fast forward a little bit here, down the bottom of the page, that's what really gives, I don't know if it gave birth to them, I'm not sure anybody knows if it gave birth to them, but it gave impetus to, to, to something we're going to call the parushim. Parushim. That's a nice, that's a nice word for separatist. One who separates oneself. Perishing. We know them as Pharisees. That's really what gives strength to the Pharisaeutical movement. Who are the Pharisees? I don't know what you want to like them to. Maybe they were the Tea Party of the day. On the other hand, maybe they were also the Occupy movement of the day. Actually, or probably we were both. Because the Pharisees tended to be everyday people, merchant class people, working class people who had some education, not necessarily scholars with expensive educations, just working class folks. Working class folks with enough brain to say, hey, wait a minute, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And the Pharisees decided, you know what, this monarchy, even though it's people by war heroes, people who really serve the nation well, it's not legit. It's not legit because God didn't send a prophet to anoint the ruler. And that's kind of the beginning of the strength of the Pharisaical movement. They are opposing their own government at this point. Not violently, but vocally. And what they decided is until God appoints a ruler. Until God anoints someone, please hold that word in suspension, until God anoints someone, we're all going to be priests. Some of this language might start sounding familiar to you. We're all going to be a priestly nation. You see, in old Israel, there were different expectations of different people. If you read Leviticus, and, and everybody should once, whether you need it or not. Everybody should read Leviticus once. And, and if you can stay away from it, because it really is a lot of list of stuff, if you can stay away from it, you will discover very quickly that there are separate rules for people who are of the priestly class than for everyday folks. Priests have a much more stringent code of behavior than the everyday people. We find that also similar kinds of things we find in Deuteronomy. We find that throughout the Old Testament, the understanding of priestly class is held to a higher standard. Now the Pharisees come along and say, well, because there's no anointed ruler, therefore we don't have a legitimate king. We don't have a legitimate king. We don't really have a legitimate priesthood either. Ergo, everybody's going to have to be a priest until, at least, God anoints somebody. That's the Pharisees. You notice how when Scripture talks about the Pharisees, typically in the New Testament, if we first hear that term, it's always something like, and then the scribes of the Pharisees came up to Jesus. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The reason for the two separate groups. We'll, we'll find more about that. Different people, groups here. Pharisees. Um, this is what the Pharisees were about, by the way. You know, 
New Testament, at least the way it really tends to paint a pretty bad picture of the Pharisees. I was doing a Bible study, you know, doing a Bible study, and an older fellow in a Bible study, you know, mid 80s, really, you know, kind of sharp guy, you know, kind of sitting there very quiet, and all of a sudden you just say a zinger in a little Bible study, and you realize, you know, you ever thought he was kind of dozing off? Uh, no. Comes out, and you know, that's just kind of my, my, my typical line when I get through the passage. So, what do you guys think? Is what I say. And he kind of crosses his arms in front of him and says, those Pharisees were a bunch of numbskulls. And, and that's the picture we get of the Pharisees. What? Here's, here's a list. If you just turn the page, you'll see kind of a list of what the Pharisees were about, what, what, what their religious and political understanding were. Here's a kind of list of them. This is true in Jesus' day. The Pharisees were non creedal non creedal in other words, they did not have, they were heterogeneous in their beliefs. They did not have a uniform creed. They had a general cloud of beliefs, a general understanding. But there was no unified Pharisaic creed. They did tend to have a belief in free will. So you can, you can choose between good and evil. You can choose whether to obey God or not, but they simultaneously believed in God's foreknowledge. So whereas you have free will, God also knows what you're going to do. Um, they believed in something we call the primacy of wisdom. What's really important in life? That you become wise. You get to be wise. That's huge for a Pharisee. Um, they believe in a literal resurrection. In other words, they believe um, you die. They did not believe when you die, you go to heaven. That term does not exist for them. They did, however, believe that at some future point, God was going to make everything new. That there would be a new world that God would make. That God would remake everything. And that they would be a part of it. Uh, that was their <laughs>
Pharisees believed that the discussions taking place on earth also took place in heaven. The Pharisees imagined that what's heaven like? The heavenly realms? They imagined God, the rabbi. They imagined God sitting there surrounded by heavenly beings and they're debating stuff. Probably different than you're These people really love to argue. So much so it was sacred. It was all part of the Torah. So that's, that's oral Torah. Um, Our Congress is made up of Pharisees. <laughs> you, you, you know, you might think that if we have our discussion about the Sadducees, then you'll discover that it's kind of like the Sanhedrin. Mostly, mostly Sadducees with little Pharisees thrown in. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Um, actually, talk about that in a minute. Uh, the, the Pharisees, they tended to be, they tended to have innovative, liberal interpretations of the law and the scriptures. That, that might surprise you. Remember when, when, when uh, Jesus' disciples, they're, they're walking down the road and have to be the Sabbath. And they're hungry. So they stoop down and they pick up some grain. Because that's what you did. The grain falls to the ground. You, 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 can't, you can't sell it in the marketplace anymore. But it was purposely left there. In fact, the uh, law said it's to be purposely left there for the Wayfarers, so they could pick it up while they're traveling and make bread because you know 7 Eleven and all that stuff hadn't been invented yet. So they pick up the grain, and somebody gets in Jesus' face and says, Hey, Jesus, why don't you tell your disciples you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath? And you know Jesus' answer it's famous, right? You know, God made the Sabbath, God made the Sabbath as a blessing. And, and you folks, I turned into a burden. God made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. And, and, and that's a decidedly pharmaceutical answer. That's a really, really pharmaceutical answer. Because the reverse would have been to say, yes, you're right. Hey, hey, you. Hey, Peter, stop that. You know, that's, that would have been strict interpretation, as opposed to a creative. Innovative, perhaps even liberal response. Saying, well, let's look at the spirit of this thing. That's Pharisees. Kind of interesting. Uh, but the, the Pharisees, okay, you know what? I know I just said something about thou shalt not murder, but I don't murder in this case. Excuse me. That's getting really annoying. Sadducees for a minute here. Um, the Sadducees are the high priestly class. Just, just by definition. The, the, the meaning of the term Sadducee, kind of lost in obscurity, probably is a portmanteau of a couple of different words stuck together that means something like the righteous ones. There's debate on what that word means. Look at it, if, you, if you Google it, you're going to get some answer like the righteous ones or something like that. Um, no one's really sure, but uh, at least they weren't, you know, as of a few hours ago. Um, maybe until they wrote a new book. About the third century BC, we get this, this, this scribal class, this, this, this priestly 
class, highly educated people, usually people from some monetary means. And, and, and they become the rulers of the rulers of the temple. They become the religious rulers in, in this Maccabean period. Why do they become that? Unfortunately, the answer is probably very simple. They don't want money. Now, now, you may want to say, well, you know, money shouldn't affect politics. I mean, it's not like I mean, any person in our nation, anyone, any pauper, white, black, green, orange, yellow, doesn't really matter, rich, poor, then that person is going to aspire to be the president of these great United States, can he or she not? Well, that's my first great teacher told me. And for a little while, I believed. Until I got made into the third grade. Oh, the coaches. And uh, then I realized that any person, black, white, etc., etc., can aspire to be the president of the United States and might even s succeed if they happen upon a fairy godmother who gives them millions upon millions of dollars for the campaign. You see, the reality is, is that money still affects politics. You, you might be able to get it with not having anything of your own. If you really want to run for office, you better find a connection to it right quick. Even local office. Anybody here run for local office? You know, I'm going to admit to it. Was, it, was, it, was that free? I mean, they just... Good amateur and good amount. That's what I thought, yeah. I'll ask you about yours later, probably. Um, you know, um, you know, if it's that way today in the land of the free and the home of the brave, imagine what it was in the third century BC. You needed money, so you get into these kind of religio political offices. They were the they were the Sadducees. Um, here, here's a here's what they did. Top of the page there. We see that it says administered. The state domestically. Remember, this is now this weird kind of theocracy going on. These people are basically priests, but they're administering the state domestically, represented the state internationally, participated in the Congress of the Sanhedrin, collected taxes, equipped and led the army, regulated relations with the Romans, mediated domestic grievances. What's Sadducees? You think they had a little bit of power? Uh. Yeah, kind of. What do they believe? There's no such thing as fate. No such thing as fate. They also believe that God does not commit evil. They believe that man has free will, not unlike the Pharisees, by the way. Big difference here. The soul is not immortal. <coughs> by, by the way, the Sadducees said the idea of the immortality of the soul is a Grecian idea that filtered its way into Judaism. Because if you look at the first five books of the Bible, the so-called Torah, you will discover that you have to work pretty hard. It, it can be done. But you have to work pretty hard to derive an understanding of the immortality of soul in the first five books of the Bible. And so it's like, no, there's no such thing as a soul. There's no afterlife. And by the way, because there's no afterlife, there are no rewards or penalties after death. They held more to the, um, well, to the idea that you see presented in the Psalms, the idea of Sheol. What's Sheol? Hell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. No. Now, Sheol, and the word is sometimes used that way, so you have kind of sort of right. But, but technically, Sheol is, 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 is a place of the shadows. Sheol is the, probably translates to the pit or something such as that, hard to say. But that's where everybody went when they died, or so ancient Hebrew people thought. Much like the Greek Hades. And, but you weren't really yourself. You know, like if, 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 if you know, I, you know, suddenly like like choked on a five dollar word or something, and, and 
died, and, and or, or nobody's willing to do CPR because they said, I don't want to touch that guy. So I died, and I went to Shell. You know what? I, I wouldn't be me. I mean, I might look like a big, tall, fat, white guy, except sort of shadowy, but I wouldn't be doing lectures down there from Good Arill because I wouldn't have the mind anymore. I'd just kind of be a shadow of myself. Not a real appealing afterlife. So, if you know, that's your afterlife, you might have a lot of none. And then as the Sadducees were, they rejected, by the way, the oral Torah in favor of strict, literal interpretation. It says this, it means this. No reason for exegetics. Just read it, understand it, and stop arguing. Sadducees. Um, they generally rejected or downplayed the role of commentaries and prophets viewing the Torah as the sole source of divine authority. Actually, that sounds a lot to me, just a, kind of the old, what's old as new files, that sounds a lot to me like um, Sola Scriptura. Doesn't it? That's Sola Scriptura, the authority of Scripture alone. Big, big, big Lutheran tenet. You know, Roman Catholic will tell you, Roman Catholic will tell you that, um, well, yeah, Scripture's important, Scripture's important, but so is church tradition, and so is the judgment of the Holy See. Kind of a tripod of authority, almost like checks and balances. No one is more important than the other. Yeah, there's what the Bible says, but there's also what church tradition is, and then there's what the papacy says. Whereas Protestants, at least historically, will tend to tell you, that nah, tradition doesn't matter. Uh, papacy, eh, Pope, Cardinals, they're, they're just human beings. It's all about what's in print. And that's kind of where these Sadducees were. Just what's in the Torah, folks. The prophets, yeah, they're interesting. Uh, Talmud, Mishnah, yeah, that stuff is interesting. That's just human writing. The Torah, that's what's divinely inspired. That's how they felt. Um, let me give you maybe the most famous example of Pharisee or the Sadducee of thought. You've all heard this story, okay? A, uh, a Sadducee, a group of Sadducees, they come up to Jesus, and they tell Jesus this funny story, or maybe it's a tragic story. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that too well. You know, there's a certain man is married to a woman. You know the story. A certain man is married to a woman, and uh, untimely death. He dies, he doesn't have any children yet. So according to law, so that this man who died may have an heir and therefore perpetuate his name, it's his brother's duty to take his widow as his wife and then bear children, or father children I should say, in his brother's name. Now as fate, which they didn't believe in, would have it, the second brother dies. And, and, and so on down the line, all the way through the seventh Brother. One bride and seven brothers. <laughs> now, I'm thinking that if I were the sixth or the seventh brother, I might be thinking, well, well, the brother's wife is kind of cute, but I can really do without the black widow here. I mean, I don't know. I'd be getting a little nervous. Well, you know, so they all die, and then, of course, she dies too. And then comes the Zayn, the Sadducees ask Jesus, so tell us, Rabbi. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Oh, we know the answer. Jesus, of course, says, "Well, in the resurrection, Jesus comes not a moment." Oh, boy, you myself. In the resurrection, neither giving nor given in marriage. We're not going to have those kind of property issues in the resurrection. I don't know what I call the property issues. Not the code study. But it does tell us what the Sadducees were concerned about. You see, the Sadducees had some particular concerns. They were concerned with something the Torah concerned itself with a lot. Property issues. Who's going to get the property? By the way, they were also concerned with patch 
natural lineal descent. Make sure things go through the male line. You'll please, please notice in this story, no one ever asks this poor woman how she feels about marrying the succession of brothers. Maybe she doesn't like any of them. Not her choice. Just in the telling of the story, if you read it with a little bit of uh, an anthropologist hat on, you can begin to understand the culture of the time. That's what the Sadducees were concerned with. Let's move on. Um, just, a, just a point on the page, if you would, please. And just a point on. Uh, we'll see, there's something about uh, Congress is filled with uh, Pharisees. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you, you may have heard some attempt to draw a modern analogy. The, the, the Pharisees are kind of like Republicans, and the Sadducees are kind of like Democrats. Right? Because the, the, the Pharisees, you know, they, had, they were kind of all concerned about religion, and uh, the Democrats, they were all kind of, you know, uh, educated elites. The reality is that's a bogus comparison. A actually, if anything, it's probably the reverse of what most people think. The Sadducees, from an Old Testament perspective, from a Torah perspective, were probably actually conservatives. They believed in a liberal interpretation. They believed in property rights. They believed in ownership society. All those kind of things we associate with conservative values, conservative economy, conservative understanding. And it was actually the Pharisees who kind of had the new final ideas. You see, by the way, it's about the same time as the Pharisees were responding to the Maccabean regime that the idea of a resurrection really begins to enter the vocabulary of the common Jewish people. One of the things that makes the Jewish culture at the time, by the way, different, big, Actually, you can tell me if you think this is true or not. I'll give you the historical part. If you look at the body of people, the body of Jewish people, the everyday folks, the shepherds, the carpenters, the um, what mining laborers, they were they were not. They weren't Pharisees. They weren't uh, Sadducees. You know. Probably about 6,000 Pharisees and maybe even half as many Sadducees. The overall population, what's the argument that? It's not. Sometimes I get the feeling today, maybe it's just the circles I travel in, sometimes I get the feeling that pretty much everybody in the country, I either left there, maybe there were 12, I think you're left here, right? You know, I think you're a Democrat or a Republican. Yeah. Uh, 
times, not all times, but many times when you read hell as a place of, we think of it as place of punishment, place of eternal conscious torment, whatever your view on that is, the original word there is Gehenna, which is a place just outside of the city, which was used uh, specifically to dispose of, of, of garbage, and sometimes to dump the body of people who were not, you, you put them under the very properly. Yeah. Shell, shell is a pit, um, but it is, but the meaning, the actual uh, theological meaning, uh, it is uh, uh, the place of shadows. Uh, other questions? Troubles? Comments? That means you're all either understanding everything, or you're totally transfixed, or I bored you silly, and you're quasi-catatonic right now. We're absorbing new information. Hmm. Okay. Good. Um, there, are, uh, there are there are two other religio-political parties that form part of the kind of religious scape of the time. Um, and we'll go through those really quickly. Um, there, are, there are the Essenes. Um, that's an uh, archaeological site. That's the uh, Qumran. That's uh, what's kind of left of the Qumran community uh, near the Dead Sea. Uh, the Essenes. And no one talked about the Essenes basically until 1946 when we discovered something really important. Um, we discovered untouched or mostly untouched Skulls of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, that have been intact since 300 BC, untouched. Um, part of what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then all of a sudden, this other group, the Essenes, who were the Essenes? They were another fairly small separatist group. They were Jewish. Um, not only the Pharisees, they objected to the secularization of the Jewish nation. They objected to outside rule. Although they weren't quite around then, they probably would have objected to the Maccabean dynasty. And they lived very much like we think of uh, monks. They typically practiced uh, celibacy. Uh, they had a very strict kind of piety. Uh, they lived in communities by themselves. They did actually enter a larger community for them. Um, and the biggest part of their lives, by the way, preservation. Preservation of scripture. They had a sense that things all around them were changing. And if we're not careful, people will start changing our faith. People will start changing our scriptures. They'll start changing our understanding of who we are in relation to God. And, and they took it upon themselves to preserve holy writ. Yes, sir. Uh, that may be why, I mean, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they figured it was uh, essaying uh, ruins in terms of preservation, and that wasn't what they were all about. That's why that stuff was there. You got, yeah, pretty much. There. I mean, some of, some, of those, some of those ruins, if you see that, those, those are the actual you know, dwelling structures, places where they live, but some of them were found were repositories, were, 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 were libraries. The Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way, are essentially the library of the scenes. Yeah. Question? No? Just an intense look. Yeah, well, I'm interested. Okay, it's good. Very interesting. Well, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm much rather the material be interesting. I don't really care. <laughs> um, but thank you. Um, so, so that's, 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 that's the, the scenes. By the way, this is also going to sound a little familiar to you. Say you were a Sadducee or a Pharisee, or you were just average, you know, average Joshua, and, and you kind of went through a spiritual renewal in yourself. I want to get closer to God. Kind of like today, somebody who all of a sudden decides they want to join a religious order, or get born again, or something like that. You admire these scenes, and say you want to become one. So you go hang out in the desert, you knock on the door. You have a three year waiting period. Imagine that. So, uh, yeah, you, you want you want to give up, you want to give up everything you got. Because that's what you do when you're in the scene, by the way. Practice poverty, you know, willing potential poverty. 
So you want to give up everything you got, and you want to give up like a, any kind of a romantic uh, social life. You live in, live in celibacy. Um, live out in the desert with us. Okay, well, there's a waiting list over there, three years. Nice work if you can get it. Well, it wasn't so much a waiting list because there were so many people dying to get in. They, they, they wanted to see if you were serious. And by, by the way, it's kind of interesting, that's what would happen later on, a generation later, if, if, if you wanted to become a Christian. If, if you weren't part of that initial way of conversion, that initial Pentecost way of conversion, you decide somewhere in the following few years or the next generation, I would like to be a Christian. First of all, somebody might try to talk you out of it. But if they couldn't talk you out of it, they would say, okay, you, you haven't, you've got to study. You've got to study for, for three years. Three years. And we won't even let you, not only will not let you take communion, we won't let you see how we do this until you pass. And, and then you have to recite our dearest held beliefs. By the way, do you know what one of the very first creedal statements in the early church? Ah, finally one of the early church. Was when you finally passed muster after three years and they said, okay, you, you, can, be a, you can be a Christian now. You had to make a, a pledge. It was a subversive pledge. It was against everything society held dear. It's a radical pledge. You had to quote scripture. You had to pledge. In, in, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Gentile, no slave nor free, no man nor female. That was probably the church's first creedal statement. say that, you can quote those words of Paul and mean it, you, you, you just flouted everything that society held dear. If you were a Jew, and you said, hey, you know, in Christ there's no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. What? What? Why would, but what about Abraham? What about Moses? What, in Christ it doesn't matter. Christ is more important than that. In Christ, there's no slave. What do you mean? I was born free. And so what? So what? Either you're a slave or a sinner, you're a slave to Christ. There's no difference. There's no big difference. Everything we fought for, everything we proud of, everything, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What about the biology? I am a man. Yeah, so what? Big deal. Just a trick of biology. Missing part of the chromosome, big deal. I mean, in Christ, that doesn't matter. It's one of the reasons why they have these people all try to kill them. Um, moving on. The Essenes, if you Google the scene, you're going to have to sit. I, actually, I suggest you don't. I won't find a big fan of Google as a repository of information. It's pretty good sometimes. But, but there's also no filter. So when it comes to the top, close to the topics, it's all popular. And, and the Essenes have kind of gotten themselves, for no fault of their own, it's a little bit, but for no fault of their own, they've gotten themselves mixed in with the New Age kind of movement. So if you Google the scene, you're going to find stuff like the Church of the Essenes. You're going to find self-styled Essenes today who are going to try to sell you Bibles of their own making that were, you know, you're going to find all kinds of interesting things. And by the way, I'm not saying they're bad people. They're really very good people. I'm just saying that's not a good way to get the sort of information on this. Um, because there is always, since the, since, since the Essenes first came to light, uh, archaeologically, there's always been some connection. Look at this thought, these are mysterious people. Because we don't know that much about them. We do know they have all kinds of rites and rituals, most of which are lost to us. So there's some sense of mystery about them. There's also some thought they may be connected to Jewish mysticism, <coughs> to Kabbalah. By the way, I don't think that's true. 
um, as I think that's much later. A um, couple of thoughts. What, what camp do you suppose Jesus and his parents were coming out of? Was Jesus a Pharisee? No. Was Jesus a Sadducee? Or was Jesus an Essene? There's some, uh, uh, there's some <coughs> suggestions that they, they were influenced by these Essenes, especially John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a more likely candidate to be the same kind of, you know, ascetic lifestyle of funky clothes, the really weird dietary decisions. Yeah, yeah, John, you know, John the Baptist, uh, you know, maybe, maybe. Um, that would be kind of the Essene thing to do. Although the Essenes, they didn't necessarily, they weren't all that bold. I mean, in the Bible, it's the sons of light and the sons of darkness is one of the Essenes. Absolutely, yeah. yeah you're, you're right. You're, you're right. There is, there is that kind of terminology. Uh, but, but that terminology also finds its way, by the way, in the Gnostic literature, as you may be aware. Um, it's all over the place. Um, I, I bring up the question because there, there are scholars who will tell you that as much as Jesus gives the Pharisees a bad rap, a lot of the teachings of Jesus are pharmaceutical. The idea of reinterpreting the law creatively. Somebody comes up to Jesus and says, okay, teacher, tell us what's the greatest commandment. And of course, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's a strict constructionist would say, well, that, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a specious question. You can't answer it because all the commandments are the same value, therefore I'm going to answer the question. Jesus goes ahead and answers the question innovatively, creatively. He says, he just takes the whole thing and he paraphrases it. He says, yeah, well, I'll tell you what the greatest commandment is. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second one is, yeah, Jesus goes ahead and says, it's, it's a huge, gigantic, creative paraphrase. And everything else hangs on that. Very far simple. Um, again, the whole business with uh, man, God made man, God didn't make man on the Sabbath, but man, God made the Sabbath for man. Very pharisaical. And some scholars suggest, by the way, the reason Jesus was so hard on the Pharisees, I mean, it's really the only place we see Jesus getting tested, right? So I was talking to the Pharisees. It's because they were his own people. Maybe. At least that's a thought. You know, we can be hardest on our own. If we ever speak a harsh word, it's often those closest to us. People we don't know that aren't we're polite. Our brother, our sister, our best friend. We'll let them all hang out sometimes. It's been suggested that Jesus was most harsh towards the Pharisees because they were his own people. Now, there are some suggestions that Jesus was an Essene. The whole business of the Son of Man, you know, foxes have their holes, birds have their nests. The Son of Man has not a place to. Um, by the way, Jesus' favorite term for himself, son of man. You know, just a quick anecdote. I remember as, as a little kid, very serious. My mom's sitting there on the, in the corner so she can find this trip. You know, um, I was a very serious little kid. You, you know, I, mean, I, I would take stuff like that. I heard Sunday school. And I would really, you know, ponder this stuff, like, seriously. Uh, I suppose an early you know, trip to a psychiatrist would cure me, but we didn't do that, so here I am today. And I remember the first time I became conscious of that term, son of man. And I was disturbed by it. Because I heard not that long ago, Jesus was the son of God. So I thought it was like a misprint or something. He said it kept coming around over and over and over again. And it would be quite a few years later when I would learn that Son of Man was kind of a euphemistic term for Messiah. The Messiah. Maybe this is the most important point today, so if you're asleep, wake up. Remember I told you a word to hold in suspension about four hours ago? I said, hold this word in suspension. Anointed. And that's the giveaway. What does Messiah mean? Moshiach in Hebrew. What does it mean? Savior. 
Derivatively, yes. But literally, the anointed one. The anointed one. In Greek, in Greek, Christ. Latin, Christus. The anointed one. The king was anointed. The king was anointed. The Pharisees were looking, they rejected the Maccabean dynasty because there was no anointed king. God did not anoint John, the nephew of Judas Maccabeus. So they rejected it. The Pharisees were looking for an anointed one. Son of man was a term for the anointed one. So that's, that's the religious milieu of Jesus' time. People looking for an anointed one. Except what that anointed one is to be, that's out of the grass. That, by the way, is, you, you, you all hear this, but this is the historical reason for this, is the historical background. And you all hear how the, you know, the Jews were looking for a Messiah, but they wanted one like King David. That's the reason. They were literally looking for a king. Literally looking for an earthly ruler. Someone that God had anointed. And by the way, that's why Jesus is so amazingly radical. Jesus says to the Pharisees, by the way, as well as to the Sadducees, my kingdom is what? Not of this earth. Because if it was, what happened? My followers, they would take up arms and fight. But my kingdom is not of this earth. You know what that does? Beyond completely toppling people's notions of what God's kingdom is about, it in fact topples their notions of what God is about. But, but, but God, are, aren't we your chosen people? Aren't you going to give us a king? And, and the one who claims to be the Son of God says, No, it's not that way. Aren't you going to raise us up? Aren't you going to defeat the Romans? Aren't you going to restore the glory of the temple? Aren't you going to. No. It doesn't work that way. And all of a sudden, people's faith is shaken. And perhaps I think the most afflictive thing that Jesus ever said, you think I've come to bring peace, but instead I bring a sword. That's the sword. It's the sword that slices up people's ideas of what God is even about. They lose it. They think they're standing on terra firma. And they realize that if we listen to this I can it, Rabbi. Everything we thought we understood about God, everything we thought we understood about God's kingdom is wrong. Or at least very much misplaced. And that's why there was so much trouble about it. That's why the Jews, first Christian persecution doesn't come from the Romans. The first Christian persecution we'll learn next week comes from inside the Jewish establishment and their own people. Because they don't like to be told you know, it was, it was as if I walked into a room full of Lutherans or something and, and I said you know Marty was an okay guy, so let's just face it, he was right about everything. I don't know if I not that I would ever say that, but I don't know if I don't know if I would make it out the door. Oh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't live to see my next, uh, what, the uh, German beer? I don't know, I mean, that would be terrible. Because some things would hold sacred. And then that's the milieu of the time. Uh, let me move away. What time is it, by the way, speaking of time? Okay, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, what I think, by the way, Jesus the Pharisee, Jesus the same. I can't tell you this for certain, and anybody who says that they can probably is grossly exaggerated. I would suggest that the evidence points to the fact that Jesus comes from parents who were like the ones that I was talking about. They weren't any of it. Joseph was a carpenter. 
You know, he, he's, not, he's not a college professor type. He's not a rich merchant type. It's questionable how much he can even read, probably just enough to get through his bar mitzvah. Probably not a super educated guy. In his personal beliefs, he probably leaned more towards pharmaceutical ideas. Jesus, his parents, you know, earthly brothers and sisters, probably believed in a resurrection, probably sided with the pharmaceutical side of things. <coughs> For one thing, by the way, it's a whole lot easier to be a Pharisee than a Sadducee. Pharisee left me, I hate to use the term, but Pharisee left me some wiggle room. I know you don't think about the Pharisees like that, but that's how it is. If you're a Pharisee, you had some room for interpretation. It's like, hey man, I'm hungry, it's the Sabbath. Well, you know, God doesn't want you to be hungry, so pick up the grain. Or is it Sadducee? Sorry, you're out of luck if you want. So they probably were coming out of that background to say that Jesus was a Pharisee, or was a Pharisee, probably untrue. Was, was Jesus influenced by the Essenes? Yeah. Was he an Essene? Probably not. No evidence whatsoever to believe that. Um, turn the page if you would. One more real quick. The Zealots. The Zealots. Um, you know, we can spend a lot of time talking about the Zealots, but uh, Zealots is the fourth, it's the fourth group. If I could just see this, just calls them the fourth group. Um, the, uh, they're the, they're the, they're the, um, well, you know, today we call them terrorists. They're the folks who are willing to say, you know what, we got to do what we got to do. Some people may get hurt in the process. They were the, they were the militarists. They were the folks who said, we are going to take this nation back by force. We don't have any of this country folks like that, do we? Um, they were the ones who were convinced that they were going to lead a successful rebellion. And by the way, they were most likely the instigators of the Jewish <coughs> wars. And we know how that turned out. Well, we don't just hang out with the Lord too. Um, I've got a paragraph or three about Flavius uh, uh, Josephus. He's uh, a very, very important historian from which we get a lot of this information. He is an outside, you can, you can read this in your ledger, he's an outside source because although, although he grew up Jewish, decidedly Hellenized Jew, he eventually, he's even a Jewish officer, even um, tries to be, he may have been a zealot, he's captured, talk about Stockholm Syndrome, he becomes part of the emperor's court, he becomes the emperor's translator, hence his name, Titus Flavius Josephus. He took on those first two names for himself. You can read, you can read about that yourself. Um, okay, more influences. Um, two names you really need to know. Uh, Hillel and Shammai, they're both rabbis, both first century rabbis. Um, and they represent opposite, they represent opposite camps in interpreting the Torah. They were kind of celebrity rabbis. You can imagine such a thing. Today they probably had their own reality show. You know, battling rabbis, iron rabbis, I don't know. Um, and they represented really, really. You know, you, you, people talk about how polarized America is today. Not that any of you would say that, but, but people talk about it. Well, things were so polarized in first century Judaism that. Um, but the typical, uh, typical thing that went around is people would discuss it. The regular people talk about the debate between Hillel and Shemaiah is, you know, there's not one law. There's not one Torah. There's two. And, and, you know, from a Talmudic point of view, we see that they, they have at least 316 different points of argument about how to interpret the law. So I thought this was kind of funny. I don't know if you can read that. You know, it's, you got a picture of two cats, they're both kind of looking up as only cats can do sometimes. And it says, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel agree on which direction is up, but not much else. <laughs> and and, and that, was, that, was, that was kind of, yeah, here's just a few examples, just a few examples, kind of pointed examples, but yeah, okay. Probably most important, by the way, who gets to study the Torah? Kind of like saying, who can be a pastor today? 
Or who can be a priest today? Who can work in a church today? Who can be a congressman today? Right? No. Admission to Parsa. The House of Shammai believed that only worthy students should be admitted. You know, you got to be background checked, you got to be vetted, you got to be recommended. Kind of like going off from West Point. Um, on the other hand, the House of Galal said, Torah can talk to anybody. Good, bad, ugly, whatever. Because if they would study Torah, they may be a miserable person when they start, but if they really study it, they're going to be better as they get into it. Which is it? You know? It's almost like saying, you know, well, we're looking for a pastor for our church. We've got, uh, we got two candidates, and one is a, a squeaky clean person who's done everything right, who's got a beautiful, sterling, Ivy League education, and the other guy's got a criminal record, has been divorced three times, and uh, we're missing 12 years out of his life and we can't account for it. Well, obviously, we're going to pick the guy with a criminal record, et cetera, et cetera, because just the fact that he becomes our pastor, obviously, doing the Lord's work is going to a better person. That's how we do it, right? Um, I don't know what I work for the uh, The truth. The truth. They have a different idea what the truth is. You think you can agree on what the truth is, right? Um, the truth. You like that picture? Um, I'm told that's something to do with some animation, okay? Um, for example, should you tell... This is a little sexist, I'm sorry. Should you tell the ugly bride she's ugly? Or do I put this in? Do I put this in modern in modern terms? You know, does this soup make me look fat? Yeah. <laughs> or does this soup prevent me from looking fat? Yeah. Oh, of course it does. You know, and, and um, you know, Shemai would have said, uh, "Hey, the truth is the truth." Honey, does this dress make me look fat? Sure does, dear. <laughs> the truth is the truth. Even in the doghouse. The truth is the truth. Don't lie. Whereas Hillel, rather pharmaceutically, I might add, creatively answers the questions by saying, well, you know, all brides are beautiful on their wedding day. Uh, I guess. Um, it brings up the point that perception is reality. You thank you, Emmanuel your, Kant, but yes. Uh, you make your decision choices based on what you perceive is going down. You better believe it. And, 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 and that was, by the way, been, uh, uh, well, it's not a large sword, it's not a large sword for Emmanuel Kant, for whom that quote is probably most connected, but, uh, but it's also a spiritual principle for her love. Or somebody else once said, what is the greater sin? What is the greater sin? The lie that brings a smile, or the truth that brings a tear. Or perhaps, as we could read in Scripture, Truth, without compassion, is a uh, sword. So, different interpretations. Um, divorce. Uh, divorce. They had different teachings on divorce. This one might surprise you. Um, uh, divorce. The House of Shammai, House of Shammai, rabbis who followed the Shammai camp, held that a man can only divorce his wife for a serious transgression. Typically for infidelity. Otherwise, guys, you're stuck with it. On the other hand, Hillel believed it was compassionate to say, hey, you know what? You can divorce your wife for something less serious, like, you know, she's burned your meal. <laughs> Honey, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but I'm, I'm getting a little tired of the burnt toast, so uh, I'll have my lawyer call your lawyer. We'll, we'll divide the property. Later. <laughs> Brings to mind a story, by the way. A perception is a reality story. You may have heard this story, but I'll tell it anyway. So I will. Um, there's a story about a, um, a couple. They've been married for many, many, many years. They've gone through thick and thin together. They have withered all kinds of storms together. They've been married for more than half a century. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, the husband, you know, he, he liked to help out in the kitchen, but he wasn't a great cook, but he would help out to whatever they made sandwiches or toast or something like that. He'd be the guy who cut up the loaf of bread. 
I guess this is before sliced bread. He'd be the guy who would cut up the loaf of bread. And invariably, he would give his wife the heel of the bread. You know what I mean by the heel of the bread? The part that's a little crust on the side. That's my favorite. <laughs> you know <laughs> well, yeah, because here's what happened, okay? Well, his, his wife had been getting this crusty heel of the bread for 50 some odd years, and finally, in her dotage, she loses it, and she says, All right, that's it. I just want you to know what kind of an insensitive louse of a man you are. I am sick and tired of this. I told you that loud, but I am just so sick and tired of this. I'm sick and tired of giving you this crusty bread. I refuse to take this piece of crust anymore. <coughs> he looks at her, and a tear is on his face. But honey, that's the best part. <laughs> you see, he loved that crusty bread. That's all he knew, you know? He just loved that crusty bread. And uh, his perception was that was the best part. And he never bothered to ask his wife what she thought. And she never bothered to tell him, like, you know, on their date. Which was saving a whole thing. Um, perception. So, uh, anyway, you can read the rest about Halal. And, um, this is probably interesting. You may not want to hear it. This may not jive with the doctrines of various churches. But archaeologically, anthropologically, Jesus does not enter the scene in a vacuum. And that's important for understanding the early church. The early church does not develop, in fact, there's a point in this whole exercise before we can even talk about the religion, just understand a little bit the milieu. Um, here's a story for you, okay? Another story. A, a Gentile wants the Torah explained. What is this Torah that Jesus was talking about? What's that about? And I guess he's a Gentile who's either got a sense of humor or he's just, just kind of a, a wag or whatever. He just... You know what I want you to do? I want you to explain the Torah to me, but I want you to do it standing on one foot. I don't know what kind of question that is. I mean, that's like, that's like somebody saying to a Lutheran pastor, okay, explain me the difference of law and gospel between you standing in your head. Just explain the Torah to me while standing on foot. And the story goes that, that, that Shammai dismisses the man as being a fool. What a stupid question is that? Get out of my sight, you're an idiot. I'm not going to waste my time doing that. Nobody can do that. Or is Hillel? Well, the quote's right there. It says, Hillel accepts the question... Stands on one foot as best he can, considering he's an old man with a big roll on. Stands on one foot and says, before he pulls over, What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. The thing that you hate, don't do that to somebody else. This is the whole Torah. The rest is an explanation. <laughs> now go and study. Now, I've put that side by side, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, the one that you know better. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? You know, verse 40, on these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Some similarity. Um, the dates, by the way, for Halal, maybe serious, but the dates by, for Halal are, are 110 BCE to 10 See, so in other words, we purported to live for 120 years. Okay? But if we take as a date of Jesus' birth, 5 BCE, we got our calendar wrong. Sorry, it is. Uh, if we take as a date of Jesus' birth, Jesus would have been 15 when we all died. So many people died to 120, like right? Moses. Um, some chance. Historically, Jesus is influenced by the teachings of Rabbi Rahman. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. But that's the religious view. Um, okay, last thing. I promise I'll ask, see if you have any questions and you can go have lunch. Maybe not a lunch like that. Um, uh, finally, get into the church. I just, just want to read two, two passages from Acts. The Roman passages, first from Acts 42. And by the way, this will become apparent to you. 
political groups. Acts. Picture of a perfected community where all were spent there. Acts 2, beginning with four, verse 42, says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done for the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with blood in their hearts, praising God, even with the rest. Two chapters later, Acts 4, beginning in verse 22. And the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one is said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. With great power, the apostles were giving a testament to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as had a need. If you have it, by the way, from, from each according to his means to each according to his means. Yeah. Thus, Joseph was also called by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of Carthage, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the film belonging to him and brought the money into the apostle's feet. Um, that's a picture, at least, the very early days of Christianity. And that's where we leave it. That's what it looked like socially. Radical existence. Radical life. Is that our worst nightmare? Do you want to go back to that? No. Do you want to be that? It's in the Bible. If we do want to go back to it, how in the heck do girls get it? If you don't, why not? Um, that's false connection. So, so ponder that. And if you're not too bored, too frustrated, or just playing catatonic, I'll see you in the same time and same space next week. Any questions? Any thoughts? Questions? Problems? Troubles? Wow. Thank you. It means I've totally phased everybody. I don't know. <laughs> Better just call upon God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you allow us. Father, where truth has been spoken, we ask that it may take root in our hearts and our minds and spring up to bear abundant fruit. Lord, we ask that you might continue to guide us and go forth from this place to do your will in faith and love towards you and in service to all who we meet. We pray in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you all, brothers and sisters. Thank you. See you.